Welcome to the Folktale Project. This is Dan Shawls. This week, we're continuing the story of The Snow Queen by Hans Christian Andersen. A tale in seven stories, and we're up to story four now. So far, we've seen the creation of a mirror that reflects all bad things. We've been introduced to the Snow Queen, as well as little Kay and Gerda, and we've seen Kay get lured off by the Queen. And Gerda has gone off into the wild world to find him. In this story, we're going to pick back up with Gerda's quest to find little Kay, her playmate. This is Prince and Princess. Gerda was soon obliged to rest again. A big crow hopped onto the snow just in front of her. It had been sitting, looking at her for a long time and wagging its head. Now it said, Caw, caw, good day, good day, as well as it could. It meant to be kind to the little girl, and asked her where she was going alone in the wide world. Gerda understood the word alone, and knew how much there was in it, and she told the crow the whole story of her life and adventures, and asked if it had seen Kay. The crow nodded its head gravely and said, May I have, may I have? What, do you really think you have? cried the little girl, nearly smothering him with her kisses. Gently, gently, said the crow. I believe it may have been Kay, but he has forgotten you by this time, I expect, for the princess. Does he live with the princess? asked Gerda. Yes, listen, said the crow. But it is so difficult to speak your language. If you understand a crow's language, I can tell you about it better. No, I have never learnt it, said Gerda. But grandmother knew it and used to speak it. If only I had learnt it. It doesn't matter, said the crow. I will tell you as best as I can, although I may do it rather badly. Then he told her what he had heard. In this kingdom where we are now, he said, there lives a princess who is very clever. She has read all the newspapers in the world and forgotten them again, so clever is she. One day she was sitting on her throne, which is not such an amusing thing to do either, they say, and she began humming a tune, which happened to be why should I not be married, oh why? Why not indeed, said she. And she made up her mind to marry, if she could find a husband who had an answer ready when a question was put to him. She called all the court ladies together, and when they heard what she wanted, they were delighted. I like that now, they said. I was thinking the same thing myself the other day. Every word I say is true, said the crow, for I have a tame sweetheart who goes about the palace wherever she likes. She told me the whole story. Of course, this sweetheart was a crow, for birds of a feather flock together, and one crow always chooses another. The newspapers all came out immediately with borders of hearts and the princess's initials. They gave notice that any young man who was handsome enough might go up to the palace to speak to the princess. The one who spoke as if you were quite at home and spoke well would be chosen by the princess as her husband. Yes, yes, you may believe me, it's as true as I sit here, said the crow. The people came crowding in. There was such running and crushing, but no one was fortunate enough to be chosen, either on the first day or on the second. They could all of them talk well enough in the street, but when they entered the castle gates and saw the guard in silver uniforms, and when they went up the stairs through rows of lackeys and gold-embroidered liveries, the courage forsook them. When they reached the brilliantly lighted reception rooms and stood in front of the throne where the princess was seated, well, they could think of nothing to say. They only echoed her last words, and of course that was not what she wanted. It was just as if all of them had taken some kind of sleeping powder, which made them lethargic. They did not recover themselves until they got out into the street again, but then they had plenty to say. There was quite a long line of them, reaching from the town gates up to the palace. I went to see them myself, said the crow. They were hungry and thirsty, but they got nothing at the palace, not even as much as a glass of tepid water. Some of the wise ones had taken sandwiches with them, but they did not share them with their neighbors. They thought if the others went into the princess looking hungry, there would be more chance for themselves. But Kay, little Kay, asked Gerda, when did he come? Was he amongst the crowd? Give me time, give me time, we are coming to him. It was on the third day that a little personage came marching cheerily along, without either carriage or horse. His eyes sparkled like yours, and he had beautiful long hair, but his clothes were very shabby. Oh, that was Kay, said Gerda gleefully. Then I have found him. And she clapped her hands. He had a little knapsack on his back, said the crow. No, 
No, it must have been his sledge. He had it with him when he went away, said Gerda. It may be so, said the crow. I didn't look very particularly, but I know from my sweetheart that when he entered the palace gates and saw the lifeguards in their silver uniforms and the lackeys on the stairs in their gold-laced liveries, he was not the least bit abashed. He just nodded to them and said, It must be very tiresome to stand upon the stairs. I'm going inside. The rooms were blazing with lights. Privy councillors and excellencies without number were walking about barefoot carrying golden vessels. It was enough to make you solemn. His boots creaked fearfully, too, but he wasn't a bit upset. Oh, I'm sure that was Kay said Gerda. I know he had a new pair of boots. I heard them creaking in Grandmother's room. Yes, indeed they did creak, said the crow. But nothing daunted, he went straight up to the princess who was sitting on a pearl as big as a spinning wheel. Poor simple boy. All the court ladies and their attendants, their courtiers and their gentlemen, each attended by a page, were standing round. The nearer the door they stood, so much the greater was their haughtiness, till the footman's boy, who always wore slippers and stood in the doorway, was almost too proud even to be looked at. It must be awful, said little Gerda. And yet Kay has won the princess. If I had not been a crow, I should have taken her myself, notwithstanding that I am engaged. They say he spoke as well as I could have done myself when I speak crow language. At least so my sweetheart says. He was a picture of good looks and gallantry, and then he had not come with any idea of wooing the princess, but simply to hear her wisdom. He admired her just as much as she admired him. Indeed it was Kay then, said Gerda. He was so clever he could do mental arithmetic up to fractions. Oh, won't you take me to the palace? It's easy enough to talk, said the crow. But how are we going to manage it? I'll talk to my tame sweetheart about it. She will give us some advice, I dare say. But I am bound to tell you that a little girl like you will never be admitted. Oh, indeed I shall, said Gerda. When Kay hears that I am here, he will come out at once to fetch me. Wait here for me by the stile, said the crow. And then he wagged his head and flew off. The evening had darkened in before he came back. Caw, caw, he said. She sends you greeting, and here's a little roll for you. She got it out of the kitchen where there's bread enough, and I dare say you are hungry. It is not possible for you to get into the palace. You have bare feet. The guards in silver and the lackeys in gold would never allow you to pass, but don't cry. We shall get you in somehow. My sweetheart knows a little back staircase which leads up to the bedroom, and she knows where the key is kept. Then, they went into the garden, into the great avenue, where the leaves were dropping softly one by one, and when the palace lights went out, one after the other, the crow led little Gerda to the back door, which was ajar. Oh, how Gerda's heart beat with fear and longing! It was just as if she was about to do something wrong, and yet she only wanted to know if this really was little Kay. Oh, it must be him, she thought, picturing herself, his clever eyes and his long hair. She could see his very smile when they used to sit under the rose trees at home. She thought he would be very glad to see her, and to hear what a long way she had come to find him, and to hear how sad they had all been at home when he did not come back. Oh, it was joy mingled with fear. They had now reached the stairs, where a little lamp was burning on a shelf. There stood the tame sweetheart, twisting and turning her head to look at Gerda, who made a curtsy as grandmother had taught her. My betrothed has spoken so charmingly to me about you, then, little miss, she said. Your life, Vita, as it is called, is most touching. If you will take the lamp, I will go on in front. We shall take the straight road here, and we shall meet no one. It seems to me that someone is coming behind us, said Gerda, as she fancied something rushed past her, throwing a shadow on the walls, horses with flowing manes and slender legs, huntsmen, ladies, and gentlemen on horseback. Oh, those are only the dreams, said the crow. They come to take the thoughts of the noble ladies and gentlemen out hunting. That's a good thing for you, for you will be able to see them all the better in bed. But don't forget, when you are taken into favor, to show a grateful spirit. Now there's no need to talk about that, said the crow from the woods. They came now to the first apartment. It was hung with rose-colored satin embroidered with flowers. Here again the dreams overtook them, but they flitted by so quickly that Gerda could not distinguish them. The apartments became one more beautiful than the other. They were enough to bewilder anybody. They now reached the bedroom. The ceiling was like a great palm with crystal leaves, and in the middle of the room two beds, each like a lily, hung from a golden stem. One was white, and in it lay the princess. The other was red, and there he whom Gerda had come to seek, little Kay. She bent aside one of the crimson leaves, and she saw a little brown neck. It was Kay. 
She called his name aloud and held the lamp close to him. Again the dreams rushed through the room on horseback. He awoke, turned his head, and it was not little Kay. It was only the prince's neck which was like his, but he was young and handsome. The princess peeped out of her lily-white bed and asked what was the matter. Then little Gerda cried and told them all her story, and what the crows had done to help her. "'You poor little thing,' said the prince and princess. And they praised the crows and said that they were not at all angry with them, but they must not do it again. Then they gave them a reward. "'Would you like your liberty?' said the princess. "'Or would you prefer permanent posts about the court as court crows, with prerequisites from the kitchen?' Both crows curtsied and begged for the permanent posts, for they thought of their old age and said, It is so good to have something for the old man, as they called it. The prince got up and allowed Gerda to sleep in his bed, and he could not have done more. She folded her little hands and thought how good the people and the animals are. Then she shut her eyes and fell fast asleep. All the dreams came flying back again. This time they looked like angels, and they were dragging a little sledge with Kay sitting on it, and he nodded but it was only a dream, so it all vanished when she woke. Next day she was dressed in silk and velvet from head to foot, and they asked her to stay at the palace and have a good time, but she only begged them to give her a little carriage and horse, and a little pair of boots, so that she might drive out into the wide world to look for Kay. They gave her a pair of boots and a muff. She was beautifully dressed, and when she was ready to start, there before the door stood a new chariot of pure gold. The prince's and princess's coat of arms were emblazoned on it and shone like a star. Coachman, footman, and outrider, for there was even an outrider, all wore golden crowns. The prince and princess themselves helped her into the carriage and wished her joy. The wood crow, who was now married, accompanied her for the first three miles. He sat beside Gerda, for he could not ride with his back to the horses. The other crow stood at the door and flapped her wings. She did not go with them, for she suffered from headaches since she had become a kitchen pensioner, the consequence of eating too much. The chariot was stored with sugar biscuits, and there were fruit and ginger nuts under the seat. Goodbye, goodbye, cried the prince and princess. Little Gerda wept, and the crow wept too. At the end of the first few miles the crow said goodbye, and this was the hardest parting of all. It flew up into a tree and flapped its big black wings as long as it could see the chariot, which shone like the brightest sunshine. And that is the fourth story in the tale of the Snow Queen. We see young Gerda get so close, at least in her mind, to finding her Kay. Alas, it's not Kay, but... At least this time, as she's heading out, she isn't barefoot. She is properly provisioned to take on the wide world. This is Dan Schultz for the Folktale Project. Don't forget that you can subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play, Overcast, anywhere you like to get your podcasts. You can follow us on Twitter at Folktale Project. You can find us on Auto Radio, TuneIn Radio, iHeart Radio, Spotify, anywhere you like to listen. If you'd like to help support the podcast, you can head over to patreon.com slash folktaleproject. And you can always head over to folktaleproject.com, where you'll find a new story waiting for you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. As always, thank you so much for listening. <laughs>